Hi, I'm Jack Cacciarola. And I'm Aaron Harness. And this is Zoomed In. On this week's episode of Zoomed In, Aaron and I will start off by hitting the headlines, talking about Congress's efforts to pass the Biden agenda and the results of the Arizona election audit. After that, Aaron and I will be joined by Justice Horn, a candidate for Jackson County, Missouri's first legislative district. And after that interview, we will finish up with tweets of the week. Aaron, are you excited for this week's episode? Jack, I'm so excited. So let's get into it. Let's zoom in. Aaron, let's hit the headlines. Let's do it. Aaron, we are in a pivotal stretch right now for President Biden's domestic agenda as congressional Democrats try to put the last pieces of a policy puzzle together. This make or break moment for the administration comes as the House and Senate Democrats debate over the two big Biden bills. Well, yeah, I mean, Jack, the first is the Biden infrastructure bill that passed in August with 69 yes votes, 19 of which coming from Senate Republicans. This bill aims to rebuild the nation's outdated and dilapidated roads, bridges, and broadband. The second of these bills is the social spending budget, which will be passed through Senate reconciliation. The bill combines major initiatives on the economy, education, social welfare, climate change, and foreign policy, funded in large part by an extensive rewrite of tax code that will tax the wealthiest Americans. This bill is hugely popular among the American people, although it lacks the full support of two specific senators that we know all too well. So with all of this said, Aaron, how do you see the battle between progressives and moderates playing out both in the House and in the Senate? Well, it's a bit of a mess right now. And honestly, for the public's sake, we need to figure our shit out. And Joe yeah. Biden needs to get these progressives and these moderates, the leaders of both sides, into a boardroom and do some politicking, some backdoor politicking, because we need some deals cut and we need these bills passed. Because at the end of the day, our future of our, the future of our country, the future of our city, the future of our infrastructure depends on it. And if we don't do that now, um, we're going to be stuck for, we're going to be stuck in, in the same rut that we've been in for decades for, for another 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, because right now we have a true opportunity to pass bipartisan reform that will really, really help our communities. And I think that to the moderates who are um, pushing back on the amount of spending, I think- (laughs) Kirsten Sinema, (laughs) Joe Manchin. (laughs) And and to them, I would say, listen, um, we spent over a trillion dollars on tax cuts two years ago or three years ago. In our history, or over the past two years, we've spent, I I don't know what the number is, but it's over $10 trillion in COVID relief. We're spending money left and right another $3.5 trillion to really help our nation's infrastructure to uh, have the most, to push climate reform, uh, to help with the economy, education, social welfare. I mean, these are all things that will help everyday people. I mean, they need to get on board. And to the progressives, I would say, stop just doing this all or nothing uh, uh, approach. I mean, if you don't get everything you want and the bill is $3.3 trillion, that's okay. If it's a little less, that's okay. You got to get to an agreement. You got to get this thing passed. This can't be a, we either get $3.5 trillion or nothing. Because if that happens, we're going to get nothing and it's going to hurt our country. And I think that we both agree that a, a good amount of great targeted spending is better than a huge amount of bad, not targeted spending. For sure. But I, I see where the progressives in the House are coming from when they say, we don't want to budge on something like you know, the prescription drug pricing, like we don't, we don't want to give that up or we don't want to just say, you know, Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin are telling us that the price tag is too big, but they won't communicate what they want to see taken out of the bill. Like if they want to actually have a discussion, we need to know what they want changed, right? If they're not actually coming to the table with real thoughts, then we're not just going to cut the bill when, when the, the spending is targeted, it's there for a reason. There wasn't a number wasn't just come up with and said, okay, let's just allocate this thing, right? This was a this was a thought out bill and, and it is specifically targeted for specific reasons. And so that's why I think you're seeing this this battle between progressives and moderates, because progressives in the House are still trying to hold on to this leverage that they have, saying we are not going to pass the bill that already passed the Senate unless we can get something that we want through reconciliation. Um, because they know this is an opportunity for them. And and I I say, take the opportunity. 
we need this spending and we need it now. Not only is it good for the American people, not only is it broadly popular, but it's poli- it's politically popular. It will be helpful for us in the midterms. And, and I think it's the time to do it. No, I, I fully agree with you. I just say to those same progressives, don't shoot, uh, don't overshoot our shot. Uh, and to the Joe Biden, uh, not to the Joe Biden, sorry, to the um, Joe Manchin and the Kristen Cinemas of the world, uh, move, move over a little bit and move to the yeah. a little bit and work with, work with them and figure out this common ground Be- because tell us what you want. Exactly. Like, at the end of the day, communicate. At the end of the day, I don't envision this $3.5 trillion bill passing as stated right now. It's just not there. And you're not going to have mm-hmm. moderates on board with this huge price tag. But if we can get a $2.5 trillion bill or a $3 trillion bill passed, hallelujah, I'll take it because that is helping everyday Americans and it's better than nothing. And, and that's what matters. And, you exactly. know, right now, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema are like the bad boyfriend and girlfriend of the Senate. They don't, we're like, we're like, honey, what's wrong? And they're like, well, I'm mad, but I'm not going to tell you. We're like, well, then we can't fix the problem. And then we can't help the American people. So exactly. help us help you, Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. Help us help you. Here's the thing. Maybe not for Joe Manchin, but for Kirsten Cinema a little more. If she doesn't vote on this bill the way it is, it's truly political suicide and not in a primary, in a general. Because the Arizona Democratic right. Party has come out and said, like, if, if you don't vote for this bill, if you're the reason that it fails, there will be serious repercussions. Yes. Now, that's not just you know, Democrats in Arizona, that's the state party saying, what are, what are you doing? This is not what we expect from you. This is not why we sent you to the Senate. 100%. I mean, so we'll see what happens, but yeah, I, we'll see what happens. But they can uh, we, I think president Biden has been, you know, hopeful in, in an outcome to come, maybe not this week, but next that will be positive. Um, and, and speaking of things that are positive, <laughs> let us pivot to some good news. Um, uh, this week, the ironically named cyber ninjas, and yes, I'm putting that in quotes, uh, have finally finished their election audit that was quite costly and quite senseless in Arizona's Maricopa County. The results are in, and Aaron, can I, can I get a quick drum roll, please? Can I just, just get a... <laughs> the audit showed that not only was there no conclusive evidence of voter fraud that affected Arizona's election outcome, but Donald Trump had actually... 261 fewer votes than the county's official canvas gave him, while President Biden had 99 more. So if, if you want a great example of constant losing, look at the GOP right now and the, the face of losing, the biggest loser, Donald Trump, the biggest loser. Well, I mean, I think Brian Tyler Cohen put it perfectly, saying Republicans aren't trying to overturn the 2020 election anymore. They're trying to set the stage to make it easier to do so in 2022 and beyond. I mean, it, it's really scary that we live in a country that this cyber, random group called Cyber Ninjas was allowed to get into our voting machines. That had never done an election audit before. Correct. Like they were, they were noobs to this, the Cyber Ninjas. And, and they were able to see who voted for who or get personal information. I mean, Republicans preach privacy and data privacy, and they're so scared of big government. But then... Uh, they, they let cyber ninjas, this random group, just come in and take all this voter data, all these social security numbers, addresses, everything. And spend a bunch of money on it, too. Spend a bunch of money on it. I mean, Republicans are the kings and queens of spending money unnecessarily, whether it's in California for $300 trillion or not, yep. million dollars on a recall that didn't work, or in Arizona um, on this stupid audit, which they're calling for audits across the country now. You know, I say, go ahead, audit Wyoming, audit Idaho audit uh, Montana, audit all of these states that Trump won by 30 points. Um, and and may, may, maybe they'll find something. I, I doubt they maybe will. Maybe they'll find more votes for Joe Biden, which <laughs> they have. They're, they are the biggest losers. No, um, no, I just, no, we don't need more audits. We don't need... What, no. What's happening in Arizona? You got Kirsten Cinema, and then you have the Cyber Ninjas. Maybe they just need to take a step back. They also maybe. have maybe. Uh, <laughs> Mark, Mark Kelly's doing a great job. Actually, do you know what? Let's just take a moment. Thank you, Mark Kelly. You've been a fantastic senator, and we appreciate you. You've been great. Great job out there. Shout out to Mark Kelly, and hopefully we can get some more Mark Kellys. Um, that would be lovely. <laughs> and and with that, uh, and with that, thank you to Mark Kelly. Uh, we have hit the headlines. Next up, an interview with Justice Horn. Today, Aaron and I are so excited to welcome our friend and candidate for Jackson County, Missouri's first legislative district, 
Justice Horn. Justice, welcome to Zoomed In. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Justice, I, I just want to hop right in, um, talk a little bit about your background and have our listeners kind of learn more about what mo motivated you to run for office. So elected, you'll be the first openly gay person of color elected to local office in Kansas City. You're currently running a historic campaign. So tell us a little bit more about what motivated you to run, how you got here, and really just who is Justice Horn? Yeah, so uh, appreciate the question. So um, kind of uh, a lot of uh, things led me to run for office um, and just being as blunt as possible, just looking at the county level and a local office here in Missouri, there aren't a lot of people who look like me or believe in a lot of the ideals I believe in. So not only was it one representation, I think that is absolutely important, but uh, also representation of ideals and ideas. I think that we still have a long way to go in having a Gen Z a representation in local government. Uh, and that's a problem. I mean, if that is a problem at the local level, imagine when we get to the federal level. So what really drove me to run was one representation on all levels, as well as I thought that my energy, uh, my youth could be uh, needed at the county. And uh, hopefully we can move a lot of policy if I uh, pull this thing off and am elected. Uh, my three policies are to bring equity, um, as well as our accountability um, and community to the county. So that is something I've learned throughout my background in community organizing, as well as I just think it's not kind of a pillar of our ideals, but it's something that is central to our generation and always making sure the community is centered in local politics. Yeah, and, and a lot of your message is focused on that. I know you say we over me mentality. Mm -hmm. Now, if elected, how will you bring that in, in uh, not being an activist anymore, but being an elected official, how will that translate uh, in, in your legislative priorities? Yeah, so uh, in several ways, I think in local politics and politics in general, it's become uh, a, a very much of an energy of we're kings and queens when it needs to be brought back to the local sense of public service. Um, I think if you are a public servant, you are always thinking about what's best for the community at large and what is going to um, advance the community at large. I think on a lot of local politicians here have just done what's good for them in their career. And that's why we've seen a halt of human rights advancement of any type of progressive ideals, as well as just any type of, you know, building the bench to include more people. There are a lot of people who are more worried about preserving their legacy, their name, than actually the longevity of the community. And that takes building the bench, opening the door, and being open to all ideals. So that's something I think that's lacking here locally, as well as in politics in general, and it's more of a community feel. I think our generation uh, loves that, and that's how we are just have grown up to believe in what are we doing for our neighbor and our community at large, and uh, that's also what activism is. Um, the Black Lives Matter was no one person's movement. It was no race. Uh, that It was something that was shared by all of us. And I think a lot of our issues from healthcare all the way to reproductive justice and LGBTQ advancement to human rights, we see this as all of our problems. So I think that's amazing and needs to be reflected. I mean, I think that's very important. And a lot of that is really coming through in a lot of your messaging on social media and elsewhere. So oftentimes people ask me um, and others around me, of why focus on local government? Why do these city council uh, races matter? Why should we vote for, why should we even turn out to vote, right? So yeah. what, what is your message to those voters who are, who are just like, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we're not voting for president here, right? Yeah. No, I think the most change that, that disproportionately affects the local community member does happen at the local level. I think this was not only shown uh, during the COVID epidemic, but as well as the Black Lives Matter movement, where we were finally seeing uh, what school boards were doing, what they were, their positions on mask mandates, or even uh, people were finally finding out what governors of states are, as well as what our mayors can do, and the relationship between federal guidelines, state guidelines, uh, county and municipal guidelines. So I think when, when policies that really affect you that matter from mask mandates to COVID distributions, or even the distribution of COVID dollars, um, I think it's as local as local gets. These are decisions that are being made on a daily basis that, you know, will affect you come tomorrow. So 
I think it's important we have more like-minded people, more people who are caring about the community, who have done organizing work that get their start there. Um, I also think that it is, again, important when we look at who's running for U.S. Senate, who's running for president, who's running for a House of Representatives, we have this big disconnect where we have the generation here and people still not getting local politics. I mean, for a lot of people running for president, running for U.S. Senate, it's local politics where they get their start. So it does worry me not seeing Gen Z or young people get in it because we're going to have this, you know, uh, just breakaway point where we just don't have good people on the federal level. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that COVID did something that COVID did was show us how important local government is and how that affects us every single day of our lives. Um, do you see a change in the mindset that young people have with regards to how involved they can be in local government and making sure that their ideas are played out on that, on that level? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it is also a proximity issue. Uh, if people are to get at all involved with activism or government, it's usually at the local level because that is something that is the closest thing to you usually know who your city council members or mayor are. So I think uh, for those who are young, who are in our generation that are getting their start, it is at the local level. Um, one, first engaging, two, organizing and mobilizing. And I hope, you know, as well as when you learn the system and find out what the problems are, that we have more people wanting to be a part of that and actually run for office. So I know it's going to take time. It's going to take uh, continued people getting uh, mobilized and, you know, organized on particular issues. But I think it's absolutely important for, you know, our generation to run at the local level because those are the decisions that are affecting our community. Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree with you. And as a Gen Zer myself, I fully support your campaign. I fully support your efforts. But why should others? Why should others vote for Justice Horn versus someone more seasoned, someone who's been around the block a few a few years? Um, so yeah, why- yeah. One thing I think, uh, and and I have as much experience as I can have from a national level, state level, and even local level. Um, I think one thing you can't teach is tenacity as well as energy. Mm. A lot of respect for. Um, our former legislators and current legislators and people who are retiring after, after a long line of service. But one thing I think our county needs is a jump start in energy with not only getting after it, but also taking on big policies like the climate crisis, taking on institutionalized racism in our detention center, and even all the way down to the tax code, how that can lock out people and, and you know be a real injustice to a lot of people. So I think yeah, we have a lot of these issues that are on our plate, but I think it's going to take the youth and a lot of energy to finally tackle things like racism, things like bigotry, things like uh, xenophobia, and so on and so forth. Things that we have just let simmer for too long. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you talk about that energy and uh, the way that you are able to represent our generation, and you have been a true champion of representation on all levels. So what is your message to young people who are looking maybe they're, they're tentative to get into local politics, maybe don't know the first steps that they take if they want to run. What is your message to them? What is your message of encouragement um, for them to represent our generation in the way that you have represented it so well? Yeah, so I think it's two things. First, um, you know, the world's tough and government and politics is tough. You walk into a room and you're the young person, you're automatically looked down on. Or seen as, oh, that's, you know, one of our interns or that's the best they can do. So number one, the only person that's going to believe in you is you, because when throwing yourself out in local politics, you know, there are a lot of people who are going to doubt you. There are a lot of people who are going to look at your age, look at you and say, you don't know anything about this world, but this is our world. This is our future. And this is, you know, our generation and community as much as it is to you. So understanding that, you know, you're going to have a lot of people who don't believe in you. And you need to know that you're doing this for the right reasons, your intentions are there, and that, you know, you're going to keep chipping away at it. Um, And, you know, the second thing is, uh, if not you, who? I think we have a lot of people breaking the barrier and finally stepping up. And it's, you know, for myself, being the first of many things, there's not a roadmap. Uh, And it's important that, you know, we're, we're stepping up and running and representing our generation because, 
you being the first, I mean, is one of many, hopefully. So understanding that it, this is tough work, um, that they don't want young people in elected office. They want us to wait our turn. But when you run, when you represent a movement, when you represent your generation, you make it easier for those who are also like-minded, who also believe in you, also have your same ideals to come after you too. That's I agree. And yeah, we, we don't have that much time to wait. It, you know, you talk about people saying, wait your turn. It's like, you know, how much time do we have left? You know, we have yeah. these existential threats to yeah. our future. And if we don't act now, then who will act for us? I completely agree. Yeah, no, for sure. And listen, folks, Justice is running um, to be the next uh, leg- be the next city councilman in Jackson County, Missouri, um, seat one. So please, please get out there to vote for him. Go to justicehorn.com. Give him a donation because campaigns are fueled off of our money. Um, so please give him a donation. Please support him. Justice, your election is in April, right? No, uh, yeah, so the primary is uh, August of 2022. Okay. Primary August. is November. Yeah. August of November. Justice is representing the future generation of Kansas City, the future generation of Missouri. And we're eventually going to see justice, not just on the city council, but in the federal legislature as well. We're in the oh, we'll party. see. <laughs> we're we're going to get him all the way there. So yeah, folks, go to justicehorn.com, support him. Justice, thank you so much for coming on tonight. We had such a great conversation with you. And we're excited to see you win. Thank you, thank you for having me. Aaron, it is time for everyone's favorite segment, and that is Tweets of the Week. For our first tweet of the week, it comes from Carrie Levon. She says, went out to dinner, and my daughter's first grade teacher was our waitress. That shit made me sad. Pay our fucking teachers. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Our our next tweet comes from a friend of the pod, actually, and that is Brett Micellis. Uh, Brett makes a list and he says things Republicans find radical. They find equality, middle class tax relief, a living wage, health care, racial justice, women's rights, vaccines and eradicating disease, as well as getting weapons of war off the street. They find all those things radical. Um, yeah, that tells you everything that you need to know about the current Republican Party. I don't I don't know what more we can say about that. Yeah. Um, and our final tweet of the week comes from The Onion. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying, if you haven't seen this news, um, this week, 88-year-old Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley announced that he will be seeking an eighth term in the Senate. Uh, he is currently 88 years old. Uh, when he was born, FDR was president. He is 88 years old, uh, and The Onion tweeted, cobweb-covered skeleton gripping Senate desk expected to seek 15th term. Uh, And they actually, they tagged Chuck Grassley in the tweet. Um, So I I, I don't even think that's parody anymore. I think that's true. I think that's a reality that we may see in in the near future from Chuck Grassley. That's wild. (laughs) And that is Tweets of the Week. And that's our show. Uh, Thank you so much to Justice Horn for coming on and talking to us. That was an incredible interview. Please go check out his campaign and do all you can. Maybe chip in a little. Donations go a long way uh, to help him win that election. And thank you to you, our listeners, for Zooming in with us every Wednesday, whether that be on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, if you're on YouTube, if you watch our clips on Twitter, if you watch us now, right now live on Twitter, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for all the positive reviews you leave us. Thank you so much for the tweets. Uh, and, and, and thank you for supporting us. We could not appreciate it more. Uh, having said that, Aaron, if the people want to leave a review, uh, where can they do that? Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, really anywhere. I mean, our podcast is everywhere. It's wild. But uh, yes, please leave a five-star review. Please subscribe. Please, if you enjoyed it. I mean, if you didn't, then don't leave a review. Uh, (laughs) And if you have other reviews that you would just like to share with us, Aaron, where can the people find you? On all of my socials, at Aaron Parnas. That's A-A-R-O-N-P-A-R-N-A-S. What about you, Jack? You can find me on Twitter at JD Cocciarella. That's J D C O C C H I A R E L L A. 
And one thing before we wrap up the show, uh, I had to do this. Shout out to my mom and dad, Dave and Beth Cotterella. Uh, they always listen to the show, and I just want to give them a quick shout out. So love you too. Uh, and thank you to all of our listeners who are not my parents. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next Wednesday.